right, Bankless Nation, welcome to another episode of State of the Nation. This is the episode where we talk about something big that is happening, that has happened in the last week. We relate it to some of the bigger picture topics we discuss on the podcast and write about in the newsletter, and then we drop some insights and action items. This comes out every Tuesday. We live stream it on YouTube. If you're watching it live now, hello. This also comes out on the podcast on Wednesdays. David, how are you doing today? Absolutely fantastic. Another great day in the world of Ethereum. Something new comes every single week. And at this point, it seems like every single day of every single week. And this uh, today uh, of this week is a new announcement from uh, DYDX and Starkware, which is going to, uh, I think, rock people's world. And so we're going to get into that uh, as well yes. as a number of other subjects. This is one of my favorite announcements because it's not just like an announcement that something is coming. It's an announcement that, oh, we just shipped to mainnet. Mm -hmm. And what they shipped is really cool. This is a, a combination, a collaboration from DYDX and, and Starkware. Um, I think of this, not their words, but I think of this as kind of a, a BitMEX killer. So like a centralized perpetuals derivatives exchange killer. That's how cool it is. But this episode is unique because we have two guests. So we have one from DYDX, the, the founder of DYDX, who we're going to introduce in a little bit, and also the founder of Starkware to talk about this collaboration. And I think there's two stories here for the bankless community, David. Um, the first is, this is the story of a DeFi app, mm -hmm. a story of a decentralized non-custodial exchange called DYDX and its trajectory of eating its more centralized competitors. Um, that's kind of the first story, and I think we'll talk about that mostly in the first half. And the second story is a, a story of the network. This is the story of how Ethereum scales, how Ethereum might come to start to eat some of its more centralized competitors, maybe some of the ETH killers out there. This is the story of Ethereum scaling through technology. Uh, so I think these stories are, are sort of interwoven and really exciting uh, to talk about, and these are the perfect guests to, uh, to, to go through them with us. Yeah, yeah, you, you said that right, where we, so it's been frustrating when we were on the Bankless program and we talk about like, oh, uh, this L2 will be deployed in two to six months. Like yes. that's been kind of the through line that we've had for like the last year now. It's like, oh yeah, this is coming. And coming. now it seems to be that the wave of like, oh, is the thing that we talked about, it's here now. Uh, and so hopefully this is the first of many to come. We could really use some scale on Ethereum. Uh, and, and like you said, uh, this is the, uh, the story of DYDX, which is an, an Ethereum application that is exactly like similar legacy financial applications or products, but now it's on Ethereum and it gets all the benefits of what Ethereum has to offer. Uh, and so hopefully this is an anecdote of a greater story of Ethereum scaling while maintaining decentralization and permissionlessness. The layer two wave is coming. This mm -hmm. is just you know the first part of that wave, the crest of the wave, if you will. We've got some other new stuff that's coming up and has come up in the bankless community lately. One is, uh, speaking of stories, this amazing story with the founder of Uniswap, Hayden Adams, another Adams on the podcast, mm -hmm. David. It was a year in the making, but just like a fantastic uh, episode, kind of the, the canonical episode mm -hmm. of the story of Uniswap, which I'm shocked is not told. In, in mainstream yet, but you're hearing it on Bankless. This is the story of Uniswap and the shipping of V3. So cool, that came out on Monday. Uh, David, any any words from that episode that uh, you want to highlight? Yeah, we, we made sure to take as much of Hayden's time as he would give us because he's made <laughs> his time so scarce up until now. Uh, we yeah. were we were going for two hours and then uh, we had to pause the interview and I was like, Hayden, like we still have like a number of subjects we want to get There's through. There's more, Hayden. Can, can, can we, yeah, can we keep going? We, can we, we keep need on more going? time, Hayden. Yeah, we need more time. And he said, yeah, I'm just going to not go to my next meeting. And, and he <laughs> he's stayed uh, chatting with us for the full two hours and 35 minutes. The complete story of when Uniswap was just a blog post on Reddit to Uniswap v3 and where we're going into the future. Uh, and and also also a similar through line, I think, to the conversation we're going to have today where that's the story of one single app, but the through line is a story of prioritizing decentralization above all else. Absolutely. Uh, we also had a really hot podcast that's coming out on Monday. We recorded that last week with commis mm -hmm. SEC Commissioner Hester Peirce. She's known as, as Crypto Mom, mm -hmm. as a moniker that the crypto industry has given her. Wondering if she is now going to become DeFi Mom as an advocate for crypto of some sorts in the SEC. So that conversation is dropping on Monday. David, we've got some great stuff going on with the Bankless Badge as well. Mm -hmm. Like, so the Bankless Badge is something you get when you become a full member 
of Bankless, right? So that's the newsletter. Can you talk about what we're doing with that badge now? Yeah, we are going to do a big push for the badge, rewarding members of the Bankless, uh, who, who hold the Bankless badge. Um, hold on, let me get that, there we go. Um, and so we are going to be giving, doing some giveaways. And so we're going to give away a BAP, for those that aren't familiar, the, that, the BAP is the crazy, awesome, vibrant uh, t-shirt that you see Ryan and I wearing, usually on the Friday weekly roll-up videos. Uh, and then we're also going to give a, a raffle away. Uh, this is a raffle, so not every bankless badge holder will be able to get one. There's only 50 uh, BAPs out there, and we're giving away one of them. Uh, maybe we'll give away more in the future. We're also going to airdrop an ETH to the raffle winner in the future. Uh, and then perhaps some NFTs down the line. I have a relationship with a, a guy who does a coffee startup and perhaps a year-long coffee subscription uh the bankless badge is something you want to own yeah absolutely so this is an nft that you get we mint them on a monthly basis you get when you become a member of, of the bankless community uh and uh, we want you to get these badges in april mm -hmm. lots of benefit to doing so these raffles are just one so make sure if you're an existing bankless member you haven't gotten your badge yet make sure you do that we will include a link in the show notes with uh some instructions where, where you can do that. Um, well, David, we should, well, actually, before we get mm -hmm. to, <laughs> before we get to our guests, I got to ask you the question we always start these episodes with, which is what is the state of the nation this week, my friend? Uh, yeah, this one's an easy one. The state of the nation is scaling. We are scaling out uh, the network. We are scaling out the nation. We are growing in how much throughput that we can put through the Ethereum blockchain with data. But then also what that means is that because we can host more data throughput through technologies like Starkware, we can also scale out the the social uh, society on this on this uh, Ethereum blockchain. Uh, it's always been one of my crazier ideas that I've had that like if we can put more transactional data through Ethereum, we can host more people. Actually, maybe that's not that crazy of an idea. That's perhaps the main reason to why we scale Ethereum in the first place. So not only are we scaling the data throughput, but we're scaling the size of the bankless nation. Scaling the social layer, also mm -hmm. scaling the network layer with transactions per second. That is going to be the conversation we will have with Antonio, who is the co-founder of DYDX, and Yuri, who is the co-founder of Starkware in just a minute. But before we do, we want to tell you about the fantastic sponsors who made this State of the Nation episode possible. MetaMask is your go-to wallet for the bankless journey. If you're going bankless, you need MetaMask, period. Browser and mobile, get them both. This is your tool to unlock the world of DeFi. Here's my favorite part. Now you can swap tokens directly in MetaMask with a single swipe. This has got to be the easiest way to trade Ethereum tokens. Choose a token you own, a token to exchange it with, and get your quotes. If you like what you see, you hit swap. That's it. What makes swaps so useful is what happens behind the scenes. It compares DEXs, aggregators, and market makers to find you the best price with the lowest network fees and the least slippage. This means you can swap a wider range of tokens, and swaps can even automatically split up your trade to give you access to better liquidity. You don't even have to think about it. Try it out. Download MetaMask for desktop or mobile now at MetaMask.io and start swapping. Bankless is proud to be supported by Uniswap. Uniswap is a new paradigm in asset exchange infrastructure. Instead of a cumbersome order book system where trades are matched with other humans, Uniswap is an autonomous piece of software on Ethereum, which is what Ryan and I call a money robot. No human counterparties or centralized intermediaries, just autonomous code on Ethereum. Input the token you want to sell and receive the token you want to buy. Something brand new in the Uniswap ecosystem is the Uniswap Grants program is now accepting applications for grants. We have been saying this for a while and we'll say it again. DAOs have money and they are in need of labor. If you think that you have something to contribute to the Uniswap DAO, apply for a grant to Uniswap. Just look at the size of the Uniswap treasury. It's almost $3 billion. This mountain of capital is looking for labor. Do you have something of value to contribute to the Uniswap DAO? No matter how big or small your idea is, you can apply for a uni grant at unigrants.org and help steer Uniswap in the direction that you think it should go. That's exactly what we did to get Uniswap to be a sponsor for Bankless, and you can do the same for your project. Thank you, Uniswap, for sponsoring Bankless. 
We are super excited to introduce our next guest. We have Antonio Giuliano, who is the co-founder of DYDX, and Yuri uh, Claude, <laughs> Kolodny, who's the co-founder of Starkware. Guys, this is the team up. DYDX has a non-custodial derivatives exchange. Starkware has some amazing Ethereum layer two tech, and together they just delivered something amazing to mainnet that we will get into we are going to let them tell us more more gentlemen it's great to have you on bankless happy launch day how are you how are you feeling thank you yeah feeling great yeah we're super excited to finally have this product live and, and out to everyone and i think you guys gave a great introduction um where the point is like we've been talking about i mean both us and a bunch of other dApps and, and scalability solutions uh, it's coming it's coming uh and it's finally here and it's just good to, to finally have everyone uh, be able to use it well antonio let's kind of start on that theme so uh tell us what did you just release to mainnet right now yeah we released our brand new layer two product obviously in partnership with starkware and this product is for perpetual contracts which are basically a type of derivative contract the most popular trading product in crypto period it's kind of a more sophisticated type of trading product uh, which gives users really great access to leverage amongst a bunch of other features but perpetuals as i mentioned are quite literally the most popular trading product by volume in all of crypto combined they're bigger than even all of spot trading combined. Uh, DYDX, we're kind of one of already the leading decentralized exchanges for perpetual contracts. Um, and the thing we just launched on layer two is not only just basically putting what we had already on layer two, we built an entirely new product from the ground up, new user interface, new backend, new order book, uh, new everything. Um, and kind of paired that with Starkware's awesome scalability solution to create something that I think is really awesome. Uh, so decentralized exchange focused on more advanced financial products and specifically perpetuals. Can we talk about just like a quick explain it like I'm five on perpetuals, uh, Antonio, before we go any further? I know we have a detailed ask me anything where you explain this thoroughly, yeah. but for, for someone who's just bought generally spot on something like Coinbase or, or Uniswap, what is a perpetual? How is it different? How is it similar? Yeah, absolutely. So perpetuals are a type of synthetic contract, which sounds fancy, but all synthetic really means is that when you're trading these contracts, the actual asset that you're trading, so say you're trading a Bitcoin perpetual, doesn't exist in the contract. Um, a derivative basically just means that you can put a lot of different like financial mechanisms to create a different asset, which actually trades at the price of another asset. So a Bitcoin perpetual, for example, is a synthetic asset which trades at the price of Bitcoin. And you might ask yourself, well, why do I want this? Like, why would I not just trade regular old Bitcoin? And the answer to that, for the most part, is the concept of leverage. Um, and the concept of leverage, what that basically means is you can multiply the capital that you're trading with. And this is a really powerful concept. So basically, you can come to GYDX and you can put down a deposit of $1,000 and you can immediately start trading as if you had $5,000, $10,000, potentially up to you know $25,000, depending on how much risk you're willing to take on. So just that concept where you can come to DYDX, you can immediately buy, say, like 10x the Bitcoin um, or whatever leverage you want to use than you could have otherwise on spot trading is a really powerful concept and something that's uniquely enabled by perpetuals. Antonio, I want to go into that a little bit more because I, I think the user story of people who are compelled by this kind of product might, may illustrate why an L2 is so valuable here. So when, we, when it comes to the full range of spectrum of people who invest in, in crypto, there's people who, who buy on exchange and then they put it in the cold stores and then they never touch it. Uh, and then on the other side of the things, there's like high frequency, like traders that are doing like 10,000 transactions a day. Um, and in my mind, DOI DX is, is, you know, obviously in the middle of that, but closer to the end of there's multiple transactions going on uh, in, a, in a short time frame, which means that we really need scale. May maybe you can illustrate for our listeners, like who are the, what is the disposition or types of traders that would come to use DYDX and how frequently are they trading? How frequently are they making transactions? Uh, and, and hopefully that goes into the story of why we need scale. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's a great intro. I'd say there's kind of two classes of customers that we support right now on DYDX. Um, and the first is kind of the, the rightmost end of the spectrum that you were alluding to in terms of the more advanced kind of sophisticated 
more like crypto funds, basically. Um, and these types of traders, as you say, do need really high performance. They need to execute a lot of trades. They need to be able to put and cancel a lot of bids and asks on the order books. They require access to more sophisticated order types, things like limit orders, things like stop orders, stuff like that. Um, and then the second kind of archetype of users that we have on the platform is more individual traders um, and not so much the like, I just bought my first Bitcoin on Coinbase type of users or kind of like in the middle where, you know, they're more active traders. Perhaps they're more actively trading uh, Bitcoin or ETH or other cryptocurrencies all the time, kind of trying to profit on shorter term moves um, up and down um, or sideways. Um, and that's kind of what we're, we're targeting, like these two classes of users. And even kind of those individual traders, they also require like pretty high performance. They require access to just like, you know, new order types. Uh, different types of derivative contracts like perpetuals, and that's what we're really focused on building for them. So, Antonio, we want to start to, to shift this to the conversation of, of kind of what's new in Layer 2 and with this new mainnet uh, deployment and um, get Ari into the conversation as well as we talk about that. Um, but maybe you could kind of tee this up for us. So, my understanding of DYDX on mainnet was that basically there was this, um, this throttle in, in terms of uh, how much you could scale on on mainnet, right? So gas was high. I think that you guys, DYDX, was were paying some of those gas fees, so you were feeling the pain as a business, and you knew it wasn't sustainable to continue providing the rich experience of DYDX and expanding into the future on mainnet. So you decided you needed like a, a layer two. Can you talk about kind of the pain points that you were feeling? And then why a layer two? And then why in particular Starkware? And then we'll get to, to uh, Yuri and his you know, description of what Starkware provides. But first, tee this up for us, Antonio. Yeah, absolutely. So I guess the, the main reason that we needed a layer two is pretty obvious for anybody that's been using DeFi is that the gas fees are insanely high. Um, and previously, DYDX on layer one worked pretty similarly to how most other decentralized exchanges work in terms of for every one trade that was on the platform that mapped to like, we had to send one transaction to layer one Ethereum. And this has been getting just ridiculously expensive, especially in the past few months. I, I believe on average, it's costing users about $150 in gas fees per trade to execute a trade on layer one uh, on DYDX. And, and oftentimes we'll see this spike up to hundreds of dollars. I've literally even seen it be over a thousand dollars to in gas fees to execute a single trade on DYDX on layer one at peak times, like when the price is moving a lot, which also is when people most want to trade. So it's like a double whammy there. <laughs> um, so, so it's just like, who's going to use an exchange where you have to pay a hundred dollars in fees to make a trade? Like nobody, uh, well, like maybe like really big whales, but like, that's basically it. Um, so that was just kind of the, the first and, and overarching problem that we needed to solve. It didn't really stop there. There were a, a bunch of other limitations actually that are a little bit more behind the scenes, but that are actually really impactful to kind of the quality of the product that we were able to build on layer one Ethereum. Um, I'll just touch on them briefly. The first is uh, this thing called isolated versus cross margining, which sounds fancy, but it's actually a pretty simple concept. What isolated margining is on layer one is you have to put down collateral separately for every different market you want to trade on. So say on layer one on DYDX, you come and you're like, I want to trade both Bitcoin and Ethereum, which is like a pretty reasonable thing, right? You'd have to put down collateral for the Bitcoin market and then separately put down collateral for the Ethereum market. Whereas on layer two, because of the increased scalability and what Starkware is able to offer um, with kind of their fully featured platform, we're able to build this thing called cross margining, which basically just means you can have one account, so you can deposit collateral to DYDX one time, and then you can just start trading every different market that DYDX has. And this is going to allow us to launch a ton of new markets. Uh, one of the really big handicaps we had on layer one DYDX was because of the scalability, we were only able to ever have three markets on the platform, uh, which is not optimal, right? Especially with all of this like exciting stuff that's going on with you know, all these new DeFi coins and things like that. Like again, like how are you going to be successful as an exchange if you can only support like three or four markets because of this isolated margining? Now with cross margining, we're setting a target for ourselves with launching 50 markets by the end of the year. Um, wow. And we're gonna start executing on this. We just announced this actually with launching Aave and uh, Uni tokens 
uh, hopefully later this week or early next week. Um, and then just continuing to roll out with like two or so markets per week after that, um, which I think is pretty exciting. And then the last thing I'll close with before answering the second part of your question, uh, which I think is a really big advantage of layer two is we're now able to offer much higher leverage on the platform, higher maximum leverage that is. On layer one, because of kind of the limitations and performance of price oracles, um, we are only able to offer 10x maximum leverage on DYDX. And kind of given a Binance recently put out some data on their users' usage of leverage, where they basically said the average leverage that people usually use on Binance is in, roughly in the 20x range. So we oh weren't able God. to support that. <laughs> wow, uh, which is not high, recommended. Yes, but... <laughs> yeah, uh, and yeah, absolutely. Disclaimer, like think critically about whether that's uh, the, the type of leverage that you want to be using. But regardless, like we're an exchange, right? And we need to support like mm. the, the leverage that users want to use. Um, we weren't able to do that on layer one. And now with kind of the improvement in performance in price oracles that we're able to have uh, through Starkware on layer two, we are able to support that. And the really cool thing, maybe just as an aside, because I think it's cool that we're able to do with the price oracles is we use the exact same price oracles, actually, the exact same decentralization and same security um, that we had on layer one uh, in terms of the chain link price oracles and then the MakerDAO price oracles as well. But we put them on layer two instead. So same decentralization, same security, way better performance. And I think that's kind of the, the overall narrative of the story. Um, is that the product is vastly improved in a lot of different ways. Um, so just really kind of quickly touching on the, the second uh, question you had there in terms of, okay, we knew we needed to scale, like which scalability solution do we actually use and kind of what led to the decision to use Starkware? There were three main things that we considered. First of all, obviously Starkware and more broadly uh, zero knowledge or Stark rollups. Um, and obviously Starkware is the leader in that. So, that, you know, if we wanted to go with that technology, Starkware was a pretty easy choice for us. Um, second of all, we considered optimistic rollups, uh, potentially something like an optimism. And then third of all, we considered other layer one blockchains. So I'm just gonna take them in turn, but in terms of why not other layer one blockchains? I mean, first of all, kind of the scalability is still like bounded and especially like the amount of state you're able to put on chain is still bounded. And that's something that, that Stark proofs and Stark rollups handle very well. Uh, second of all, just the, the, the state of the world in terms of like the, the quality of wallets, the quality of cross-chain solutions, the quality of developer experiences on layer one is not there yet. Like, I don't know, suppose we were to move to like Nier or Solana or something like that. Um, you know, what wallet are users going to use? Like would they wouldn't be able to use MetaMask. Um, and that would be like a really big detraction and kind of the user experience we're able to offer. Um, and also like, how are they going to get their coins over there? Um, like what cross-chain solutions are available? It's just not, we wouldn't be able to, to offer the same product experience on, on those axes if we move to a different layer one. Um, then kind of optimism and, and optimistic rollups that rolls up to Ethereum in a similar way to, to how our product with Starkware rolls up uh, to Ethereum as well. So we can, you know, we could still potentially use like the same wallets, uh, same everything like that with Optimism. But with Optimism, there's there's a couple of big, uh, I would say, you know, I think there are trade-offs, but for us, like I think the main trade-offs with, with Optimism that weren't optimal for our product um, were first of all, the withdrawal period is really, really long. Um, this is something that I think has been talked about uh, by a lot of other people in this space, but really high level overview. Uh, because of the way optimistic rollups work, you can't actually take your money out for, you know, roughly a week or so, which is a really big problem. Like who's going to use an exchange again, where you can't withdraw your funds for a week. There are ways to get around this. You can potentially use like a central kind of liquidity provider to front withdraws, but then the central liquidity provider has to have capital proportional to a whole week's worth of withdrawals on the entire system which is like, even for us at our scale, like a ton. And imagine if you're trying to scale to like a Binance level, like all of the withdrawals for Binance for a week is just like more money that probably exists in like all of crypto. Um, so, so that, you know, we couldn't use for that reason. And also like one big kind of downside or no, maybe, yeah, I would potentially, I would say like a downside for now, or at least something that's very unproven with optimistic rollups is first of all, they're, they're not, you know, publicly available on production yet. And that was something that's really important to us. Like Starkware has a, a really solid and long history of already being live in production for a while now, actually, um, with, with Diversify, uh, which is another decentralized exchange which offers spot trading. Um, and that gave us a lot of confidence that, you know, we need to scale now. Like our users don't want to wait for like months on end to be able to scale. Uh, so which, which scalability solution is the most production ready? 
Um, and I think that was obviously Starkware. Um, and that was a big factor in, in our decision to use them as well. Great answer, Antonio. And I, I'm wondering, Yuri, if you could kind of uh, continue the story here. So a Antonio's story, he's got sort of this, this DeFi app. Um, it's getting tremendous product market fit, but uh, gas fees are becoming too much. You know, on-chain, main-chain congestion is, is too much. And so he needs some sort of a, a layer two solution. I'm wondering if this is a similar story you're hearing from other DeFi apps. And um, also, could you tell us a bit about what Antonio was talking about. So in the in sort of the press release and the announcement, there is um, a solution called uh, Stark X, I believe. Uh, is what is that? Is that is that the solution that DYDX is built on? Tell us about that. So please continue the story. Sure. So um, DYDX's story is is really the quintessential experience for a lot of of, uh, of DeFi applications. And, and they're basically, you know, the, the worst thing that could happen to you if you launch a DAP is that, you know, no one shows up. The second worst thing is that if, you know, everyone shows up. And, <laughs> um, and that was sort of DYDX's experience. And then, you know, when we first started talking to Antonio and the DYDX team, their spending um, in terms of, of uh, annual exp uh, monthly expenditure on gas uh, compared to revenues was fast rising. And shockingly enough, uh, in no way bound by their monthly revenue, right? So gas spending was crazy. And you have this odd situation where, you know, you've spent on customer acquisition, they show up, they knock at your door, and you have this minimum trade size. And this minimum trade size is in fact rising. So, okay, so I traded for 2K, you know, I, I made a 2K trade today, which was fine with the YDX. Gas prices keep moving up and they just pushed up the limit to whatever, three or four. I think it went all, all the way to 7K or even beyond that at some point. Now, what I could from, think about this from a user experience perspective, I could conduct this trade two weeks ago or a month ago, and now I can no longer do that. How, you know, how, how difficult is that in terms of a customer experience? Um, so in that regard, I think the DYDX story is very, very much uh, sort of the standard DeFi story, a situation where transaction costs are really killing the business and killing the sort of the, 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 the narrative for permissionless blockchains and DeFi, this, this democratization of access to these tools. Uh, there's nothing democratic about a transaction at you know hundreds of dollars. Everything uh, becomes a whale chain. Every everything becomes a whale chain, and you're saying, so hold on a second. The, the whole exercise was you know to end up with this kind of story. No, that's not what we're here for. So uh, so in, in that regard, it's, it was a very I think I think it's a very typical typical story, and then we've heard it from uh, from other uh, uh, teams as well. Uh, in terms of uh, your question about StarkX, so StarkX is our scalability app, uh, and currently it can support a whole bunch of uh, different functionalities. So it can support transfers and spot trading, and this is what we've been doing with Diversify since June of last year. It can support derivative trading, and this is live on Mainnet with ZYDX as of uh, this morning. And um, it can support NFTs, both minting and trading. And for that, you won't have to wait more than actually a day uh, to see on Immutable X. Um, so it can support a whole slew of, of different functionalities. Um, and this is all powered by Cairo. Cairo is a, a Turing complete language that we've developed, developed in-house at Starkware. And it can support uh, the scaling of uh, any DAP, any business logic using Starks. Uh, and it's, it's a very efficient language. Uh, and the proof is in the pudding here. Uh, we are able to to uh, uh, to support DYDX's transactions today at uh, below five thousand gas per transaction. That's pretty incredible. Um, yeah, I, I'm wondering if if maybe we could go into uh, that in a little bit more detail because sort of in the in the crypto community and uh, anyone who's familiar with engineering always recognizes that there there are some trade-offs with a solution um, have we made any decentralization trade-offs here Yuri, in implementing something like uh stark x uh, so dydx on mainnet versus a dydx in uh, stark x on a zk roll-up chain um, have we lost anything are there trade-offs that have been made? Obviously, we got the gains of, of scalability and many of the gains that Antonio was just talking about, but what have we lost? So um, I think that we actually haven't lost anything. DYDX had an off-chain operator uh, beforehand and still has one now. 
they had the 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 intuition and, and tremendous wisdom you know and this is going back to what an antonio mentioned to actually redesign their system okay so in a lot of a lot of cases and a lot of the layer two teams are saying you know we're going to have this big red button that says compile my solidity code into whatever it is to the optimistic rollup up uh, uh, of choice or to the zk rollup up of choice etc just take my business logic that i wrote for layer one just move it to layer two and DYDX uh, had the good sense, actually, not to even aim for that, but to actually take a step back and say, hold on a second, we have this off-chain operator. Right now, it is centralized. DYDX, Antonio can talk about this in great detail. They, they have a, a decentralization vision that they're aiming for. But as a first step to say, let's see if we can make this system better uh, by having this off-chain uh, 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 entity function in a much more trustless fashion. Okay, and what can be done using Starks in that regard and, and cross-margining and uh, much higher frequency uh, price oracles and the benefits that this uh, brings in terms of leverage in the system and the, the ability to introduce so many more assets, the removal of minimum trade size, all these uh, uh, features are a result of the fact that they actually redesigned the system from scratch using the tooling that we've developed. Let's go. I'd like to go into this off-chain operator a, a, a little bit more. What 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 does the off-chain operator do, and how it, how is it when DYDX is on the main chain, and how is it different when uh, uh, DYDX is on the uh, Starkware? Yeah, I can take this one. So it's basically exactly the same. Uh, so DYDX is right now what's known as a hybrid exchange uh, by some people, which basically means that we have some kind of off-chain operators, and then we have some things that are on-chain uh, as well, which are, of course, the smart contracts. Basically, we run our order books and we run our order matching um, in an off-chain way. Um, and we have been doing that for, I don't know, like two years or something now. Um, and this model just allows us to get kind of the really big increase in performance that I was touching on before that's basically required uh, for kind of the level of traders that we're trying to attract and kind of the crypto funds and advanced individual traders. So we've had that for a while. And I think the point that, that Yuri was making, which I would wholeheartedly echo, um, is that we haven't changed that at all um, to kind of move from Ethereum to Starkware's layer two. Um, and the, the re, you know, basically what we have is we just kind of store these like off chains like cryptographically signed messages, which are kind of similar to ZeroX orders if people are familiar with that. Um, and we store these on kind of our off-chain matching system. And then whenever we execute a trade, we just send it on over to Starkware. Um, they do all of kind of the, the Stark proving and the batching and things like that, which is where all the scalability comes from. We can probably dive into that more later. Um, and then it gets all just put on chain in a really quick way. And then once it's on chain, uh, it's 100% as decentralized because of the, the Stark proofs and kind of the validity checking that goes on in the smart contracts as anything else on layer one Ethereum. So how would you uh, describe that dichotomy between what you guys do on chain and what you do off chain, right? So uh, assets obviously stay on chain. You can't actually remove mm -hmm. them off chain, uh, but then just the order, the, the logic and in, in order matching is off chain. What does, what, what does that mean for the trust of the user with in regards to DYDX? What are they trusting you to do? And if perhaps if you guys were malicious, what could you do? Yeah, absolutely. Good question. So they're basically trusting us to uh, just like allow them to to trade on the, the order book, right? Um, and there are ways basically where you can trade on the exchange. They're, they're not normally used, but they're basically used uh, if a user, you know, even so much as thought we were being malicious for like whatever reason, you could go directly to the smart contracts. You could trade out of your positions. You could close your positions. You could always withdraw. So that's kind of where all of the non-custodial trading comes from. So like normally you go through the front door and, and you just talk to our matching engine. Um, but then for whatever reason, if you want to, you can always just go directly to smart contracts as well. So they're really not trusting us for, for anything really. Um, I mean, we could potentially give them like a degraded product experience, like if we want to, um, but you know, they could always just go to the smart contracts and, and withdraw their funds and trade that way as well. So there's nothing, and there's nothing about the DYDX protocol that can't be accessed by the user. You guys just kind of have like a, a monopoly on the front end. Is that a, is that a good way to put it? Yeah, I think that's a good way to put it, basically on kind of like the product that, you know, the, the website that we've built, basically, um, I like using that has to go through our matching engine. Mm -hmm. 
So Antonio, I wanted to just get this question out of the way because um, you know some folks that are listening are obviously based in the U.S. and when they try to access the new DYDX, uh, they're geo blocked. I'm just curious if you could get into the to the reasons why. And of course, they are geo blocked on on the front end. Anything that is on chain as a smart contract cannot be geo blocked. Um, but can right. you talk about the reasons for that and where sort of that's coming from? Yeah, absolutely. So it's a very complicated issue. Um, and I won't touch on like every like specific like legal issue here, but the place it's coming from is just kind of a, a legal and, and regulatory obligation uh, that we have. It's very similar to basically like any other crypto exchange that supports derivative products right now. Um, again, it's quite complicated and this is like a very high level like overview of it, but it's basically like derivatives are very highly regulated like in the US um so we can't offer the the products to us customers for for that reason um and that's something that's pretty standard across the crypto industry and again just echoing kind of what you're saying too where it's like you know you can't use our website basically um but again like the the protocol and the smart contracts are still available to, to everyone and they can't be censored can you underline and emphasize uh what's different about dydx versus a centralized competitor so when i think of a you know centralized derivatives exchange i always think of like the the go-to bitmex right for instance what is the difference between dydx and bitmex from a trust perspective what do you you know trusting in, in a bitmex that you don't have to trust with dydx yeah absolutely so this is a good question so the first and probably most obvious thing to anybody that knows what's going on in DeFi um, is that on a centralized exchange, you're trusting them to custody all your funds that are on the exchange. Um, it's very similar to like a Coinbase or Binance or anything else that's out there. But the reason why this is especially impactful in uh, derivatives contracts is because on spot trading, you can normally just say like, go to a Coinbase, make your trade and withdraw immediately back to your hardware wallet or whatever you're using, right? Um, you can't do that on a derivative contract. You have to leave collateral on the exchange for the entire time you have your position open. So you may have to say, leave your all of your crypto on a BitMEX or something like that for months on end, like as long as you want to like hold your levered long position on Bitcoin or whatever you're trading. Um, on DYDX, you, you know, because it's non-custodial, you don't have to trust us with your coins. Um, they're always withdrawable directly through the smart contracts and the security uh, is basically the same as you would get on, on any other decentralized exchange. The other thing that you're really trusting that's also very important to a BitMEX or any call it like centralized derivatives exchange is not only the custody of your coins, but also the execution of the contract that you're entering into. Um, so, you know, there, like I said, and kind of alluded to these contracts are fairly complex under the hood. There are a lot of different financial mechanisms that are used. There are things like liquidations that happen. There are times when insurance funds are used. There are times when you're deleveraged onto, um, all of this. And on a centralized exchange, you're really just trusting that the exchange itself will honor or will kind of like execute these contracts that you've entered into as per what they said they're going to, but there's no way for you to tell. And it's a black box, right? There's no way for anybody to really like go in and like audit the system and really understands like, are the rules being executed? Um, like how are these contracts working? Whereas what we're able to build um, on our products through Starkware's layer two is something that's really transparent. So like the rules of these contracts are quite literally coded into in code the smart contracts and, and basically Starkware system that Yuri was talking about with, with Cairo and everything like that. Like the funding rates, the liquidations, the deleveraging, everything is coded into the smart contract. So again, it's like you don't have to trust us to execute your contracts, just trust the smart contracts um, or trust like these like third party audits that we have in all of this. Um, and that's just a, a much more secure and transparent way to trade. And so that was the, the compare and contrast of what is basically a, a DeFi app versus a centralized yeah. competitor. But with this new uh, Starkware announcement, there's actually a lot that's actually now the same with BitMEX and the same in a, in a good way, which is uh, the performance that is matching of a what you would expect in using a centralized exchange. But you still retain all of the power and trustlessness and non-custodial nature of smart contracts and auditability of smart contracts. And this is, I think, the through line that a lot of people miss about uh, about um, rollups and 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 uh, other L2 scaling solutions is that ultimately, at the end of the day, 
we keep all of the power of you know code is law and we gain the usability and uh, uh, just good experience of what a centralized exchange can offer. Is that a good way to describe this? Yeah, I think that's a great way to describe it. And that's something we've been pushing for uh, for a long time now with DYDX in general, just like trying to build an app that from a UX perspective is every bit on par or you know, even ideally surpassing what is available on centralized exchanges. I think we've really been able to build it on kind of this new product on layer two. Uh, as you mentioned, still retaining all of these great security and transparency advantages, but now we have instant trading. Now we have just a really simple onboarding experience, just like come with your Ethereum wallet, like any other decentralized exchange, immediately start trading. You know, that's way better than a centralized exchange, right? Where you have to like do KYC, you have to like do all the stuff, like set up your 2FA. Um, so now I think we have a product that's every bit on par, you know, if not superior in some ways to centralized exchanges. And we're excited about that. Guys, the user experience of this, if, if you've ever used, uh, obviously, MetaMask, everyone who's listening to Bankless has, has used MetaMask. You just connect MetaMask, literally, to this new DYDX exchange on Layer 2, and it's, it's gasless. There are zero gas costs, and the experience is just phenomenal, right? Like, transactions going in instantly, zero gas costs. Uh, it is so cool to see the, you know, the, the possibilities, all of the the user experience enhancements that layer two can bring. I, I just want to end this question um, where we're talking about trade-offs and, and sort of security versus uh, BitMEX with maybe a question to, uh, to Yuri here. So um, Antonio was describing all of the trust assumptions in a centralized uh, derivatives exchange like, like a BitMEX, right? We didn't quite get to sort of the, the base layer trust assumptions. So let's say Antonio and DYDX just decided to deploy this on Binance chain or create your own proof of authority XDAI type network, deploy it there instead. Um, my understanding, and hopefully those who, who tune into the Bankless program is they are now trusting a, uh, a different protocol, essentially. They're no longer trusting Ethereum. They're trusting the validators uh, that validate transactions in that new kind of sidechain network. Um, with DYDX on layer two in Starkware, uh, are there any additional trust assumptions that we've added here? Or is this the equivalent of you know, deploying something on mainnet. In other words, what I'm trying to ask Yuri is, are we trusting anything other than the security of the Ethereum base chain with this layer two deployment? So uh, as you point out with uh, something like Binance chain, uh, we know for a fact that, you know, there are, I think a handful of seven computers that if, you know, those are compromised, um, your assets are essentially, you know, at, at the whim of, of uh, whomever it is. Uh, whereas on Ethereum, it's a very different story. Now, the beautiful thing about validity proof systems and StarkX in particular in this regard and everything that we're building is that um, we are, our hands are completely tied in terms of uh, our ability to, to act as malicious players. Meaning even if our systems are compromised, both software and hardware. Okay, think of this sort of thought experiment. If we hand over the keys to a malicious party and say, these are our servers, go and operate them. The worst thing they could do, in fact, the only thing they could do is deny service to users. And as Antonio pointed out, in that situation, users can go directly to the smart contract with their transaction and say, my transaction here has been denied. I haven't been served this past uh, a batch or the last couple of batches. The smart contract basically raises a flag for the off-chain parties for Starkware and DYDX and says, here's a user complaining, serve their request. And if you don't, within a reasonable time frame, I'm freezing the system. Okay, meaning any user who's denied service has the power to completely halt the exchange's operation. Wow. Okay, way back in you know in the, uh, <clears throat> the Cold War, this was called you know mutually assured destruction, right? <laughs> Next, next best thing to you know the Americans, the Russians, each having no nuclear was weapons was to you know have an awful lot of them. Here, there's this mutually assured censorship, right? Meaning, if DYDX, if Starkware censor users, any user who's censored has the ability to single-handedly censor the exchange in return. Now, that's an awful lot of power given to individual users in terms of, of ensuring their rights and their self-custody of their assets. 
and, and that's essentially that's as good as, as one could could get here, uh, as Antonio points out, while maintaining a lot of the benefits of a centralized operation. Yuri, what about the possibility of a user using this power when they shouldn't? Can they make this? Can they try oh. and get this thing shut down in uh, false pretenses? No, no, no. So this this is not like riding the subway in a, you know some prank uh, right. pulling of the emergency brake because you come to the smart contract and say my transaction has been. Uh, denied if that transaction has been included in the last batch there's nothing you can mm. do about it you can't you know the, the, the crying wolf here won't help if you've been <laughs> served you've been guys this is why we are so excited about this because we get these scalability benefits but we preserve banklessness we do not have to trust a third party custodian you don't have to trust a bank with your funds when you're using the dydx exchange on Starkware. We're going to talk more about that. We're also going to get into how Starkware solutions and how ZK rollups in layer two scale Ethereum and scale DeFi. But first, we want to tell you about the sponsors that made this episode possible. Synthetics is Ethereum's decentralized derivatives liquidity protocol. What does that mean? Synthetics is a platform for creating and trading synthetic assets, which are assets that are priced via an oracle rather than bids or asks. Traders can use the Quenta exchange, which hosts and trades all of the synthetic assets created by Synthetics. Traders on Quenta can trade synthetic tokens like SBTC, SOIL, or SDFI. Because Quenta is powered by Synthetics, traders experience zero slippage on their trades. No, I didn't mean low slippage. I meant no slippage because that is the power of the Synthetics platform. No slippage on your trades. You can also easily short assets with iSynths, which are synthetic assets that move inversely to their target asset. Synthetics isn't just for traders. Developers can build on Synthetics to access the infinite liquidity offered by synthetic assets. Or investors can stake collateral to the protocol and earn fees that the protocol collects. If you're a trader and you're looking for a trading platform not found in the legacy world, check out Quenta.io. If you're a developer or you just want to earn yield on your collateral, go to www.synthetics.io where you can stake your SNX or ETH and earn fees from Synthetics. Gemini is the world's most trusted cryptocurrency exchange. I've been a customer of Gemini since I first got into crypto in 2017, and it's been my main exchange of choice to make my crypto buys and sells. Gemini is available in all 50 states and in over 50 countries worldwide. And on Gemini, there are markets for over 30 various different crypto assets, including many of the hot DeFi tokens. And it's one of the few exchanges that has liquid die markets. Gemini just launched their Earn program, where you can earn up to 7.4% interest on 26 various crypto assets. If you're tired of paying fees in DeFi, or you don't want to worry about DeFi exploits, but you still want to earn interest on your crypto assets, Gemini Earn is the product for you. Another product I'm stoked to get my hands on is the Gemini Crypto Back Credit Card, which gives you 3% cash back on all of your purchases, but paid to you in your preferred crypto asset. When I get my Gemini credit card, I'm going to make sure that I get my cash back in ETH. So whenever I buy something, I get a little bit of ETH bonus back to me at the same time. You can open up a free account in under three minutes at gemini.com slash go bankless. And if you trade more than $100 within the first 30 days after sign up, you'll be gifted a free $15 Bitcoin bonus. Check them out at gemini.com slash go bankless. Guys, we are back with Antonio and Yuri. We, we're talking about the subject of Ethereum scalability. And this is, is sort of the question that's in everyone's mind right now, especially as gas fees uh, continue to go up and block space demand on Ethereum continues to increase, is how soon will Ethereum scale? Um, I want to contextualize this before we talk about you know where starkware is is adding value and helping to solve this problem with with a question do you think yuri there is ever a point at which we say we're done okay ethereum has scaled it's over we've meet we've met the threshold mission accomplished, uh, mission accomplished. yeah exactly so uh, you know i think when considering that question uh, uh one good analogy is to look at what happened with bandwidth say, over the past uh, 20 or 30 years, okay? And there, in a very clear way, the answer has been a resounding no at any given point in time, right? Uh, are we done, you know, our optical fibers can do this, are we good enough? No, what about the routers? You know, what about uh, 
uh, uh, cell phones? What, what, what about streaming video? What about live uh, broadcasts? Uh, you know, thousands of people and so on and so forth. The, 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 the thing about, about uh, scaling solutions is that as they mature, as they become stronger and more powerful, new applications suddenly become available and those present ever you know, increasing demands uh, in that dimension. And we're only starting to scratch the surface here. Uh, you know, saying we are no longer dealing with hundreds of dollars in transaction fees, we're going back down to whatever, to you know, fractions of a dollar. That, that sounds to me like sort of an entry condition for the discussion, right? Now, the question is, can we make this 100 times, 1,000 times, 10,000 times cheaper? And what will that mean for applications? So we're far from that point. So maybe we are even now still at the 56K modem days of, of that have bandwidth. No doubt of that. Well, yeah. so how does it happen then, Yuri? So um, re recently, Ethereum has almost, I want to say almost pivoted in a way. We had Vitalik on not too long ago to, to help explain uh, what um, rollups are. And he talked about the difference between optimistic rollups and ZK rollups. And he seemed to, um, you know, his, his take was like optimistic rollups, they're kind of ready here. ZK rollups, they are too for specific applications. He also said he thought in the future, ZK rollups, because of these crypto, uh, cryptographic guarantees, might be even more important to the Ethereum scale, scalability journey in the future. I'm wondering how you see it. And, and take us through the like, What's happening now, and then how's it going to play out in the next, you know, year two, year three from now? So uh, the the interesting thing about this narrative, and of course we've heard uh, Vitalik and read his post about rollups and all that, but the the you know in rough lines the story was, you know, optimistic rollups are here; they're going to dominate the near and midterm. ZK rollups are going to take care of the long term because eventually the tooling will be advanced enough, uh, and they'll be able to handle general computation. Now, Cairo is a general computation, a Turing complete language that's been on mainnet since June. And as we see today with DYDX, a ZK rollup is live you know, from a massively scalable application on mainnet, well ahead of any optimistic rollups. And there are no uh, proverbial sort of custodial crutches here, right? There, there's no sort of emergency button that we can hit that says, hold on, hold on a second, you know, this, we, were, we were only kidding. We're just testing the system. This is it. This is a live system, and it's handling very complex uh, uh, arbitrary computation defined by DYDX. So ZK rollups, in spite of this notion that they're you know, only going to happen later on in the future, are ready for prime time uh, ahead of optimistic rollups. Uh, and, and that's a message that we want to send across to the ecosystem and say, whatever your needs are, whatever your computational needs are, and your, you know, no matter how you want to scale your application, uh, we're ready for you. Uh, we're ready for you today. Uh, so that, that's on the topic of ZK rollups versus optimistic rollups. Yeah, I think that's a great point that, you know, the fact that ZK rollups have, have beat some of these uh, optimistic ro rollup solutions to market is, is definitely of note, at least to, to me and I think David and many people um, on the Bangladesh journey. I want to ask you about um, uh, the ability to have a Turing complete uh, programming language inside of a ZK rollup, because when we, we talked to Vitalik, he was kind of like, well, this is the hard part. And it sounds like you have started to solve that. Um, can you talk about this? What I think people really want is um, something that's EVM compatible. I can just take my existing DeFi app with a few minor tweaks. I can put it in a ZK rollup and it just kind of works out of the box. How close are we to that? And can you talk about the strides that Starkware is, is making on that front? Sure. So we, it's not that we've started uh, on our journey to a train complete language. We have it. It's done. It's in production, right? Uh, uh, DYDX, Diversify, uh, the Reddit scaling day off last time are all using Cairo. So that's that's just a comment on that note. Now, um, the question with these things, and 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 I I, I think we're sort of you know this is sort of uh, uh, a lot of people think about this like you know this is California in, in the early 19th century. It's only just begun. So all sorts of real life considerations like like efficiency, capital efficiency, cost, et cetera, people are saying, don't worry about all that stuff. Now, efficiency of, of a ZK rollup is a huge deal, okay? So building a, 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 something that compiles EVM bytecode or solidity to, uh, uh, you know, to say to Cairo or, or uh, other languages is cer certainly a, a doable task. The question is how efficient 
is the uh, resulting system, okay? And it is considerably less efficient than something that is built natively, say in Cairo. How much less efficient? I uh, think something on the order of between 10x and 100x less efficient. Okay, now these are costs that would someone have to bear in the context of the system. But going back to, I think, a much more fundamental point, the notion of saying, let's just take my solidity. And you know, I got to tell you, solidity isn't the kind of language where programmers say, you know, just my, you know, just let me have my solidity. It's just no one's in love with amazing. solidity. <laughs> no one's in love. You, you have met to meet the guy who says, OK, I'll do anything you want. Just you know. so, <laughs> so. But no, the thing is that even if they did love solidity, OK, as, as Antonio pointed out with their system, uh, the, the question is not so much the use of Solidity per se, but the fact that Solidity was designed to run on layer one, okay, with the massive constraints of running on layer one. Now, if all you did was take that logic and ported it to layer two, you've missed out on a lot, meaning a DYDX could have done that. Let's assume, so, you know, we had that capability before launching the system. DYDX would have ended up on layer two with a system with a price oracle feed every 15 minutes, uh, uh, three assets or two assets only, uh, no cross margining, uh, no instant trading, none of all the cool stuff that right now is sort of what's making this system a huge system. Um, so, so they would have gained nothing other than scale. It sounds like you're ordering, like it, it sounds like you're making the argument, Yuri, that um, rather than just port the stuff that we have from mainnet to layer two, we should take a more first principles approach. No doubt. And no you, doubt figure out what would be best in a layer two environment. Is that the argument you're making? A hundred percent. Yeah, I think that's a great point too. I would wholeheartedly uh, echo this. And that's kind of what I was saying before where like, yeah, the scalability is great. And like, that's like, we have to solve that. But you get like so many second order benefits where if you're like, okay, well like now with this new, like more scalable system, what other features could I add? Like, could I make my price circles more performant? Could I make my, you know, could I have cross margining? Could I have like, you know, whatever. Um, and I think there are a lot of things for, for any given application where that's the case. And I think for good developers, it's really not a big deal to like rewrite things or write things like from first principles again in a new language or on a new system. So I really think this narrative where like we need everything to be in solidity is, is a bit overhyped. And I also strongly like echo like Yuri's points about like, you know, just we need to move away from this kind of notion that like optimistic rollups are like the beginning and then like we'll go to ZK rollups later. Like look what's in production right now. Like they've been live with like Diversify for like, you know, a year now. DYDX, one of the most like complex, like computationally complex things on all of layer one Ethereum, like straight up, like already live on Starkware now too. So it's like, we're, we're not talking anymore. Like it's here, like go use the product. Um, and I think that's a powerful thing. This, this is why we love this, by the way. We love kind of the um, the, the rush to ship in layer two because it's kind of a survival of, of the fittest, right? All of these layer two solutions are, are competing to be the dominant one. Uh, and um, it's awesome because as a as a DeFi user, we get the benefits of that. We get to start using DYDX maybe a little bit quicker. But I, I'm yep. curious, this this whole approach, Yuri, that you're talking about, sort of this, this first principles approach, um, I almost want to hear the the Starkware vision for layer two and what you guys have planned because we've heard sort of the optimistic rollups vision. We've we've heard high level, you know, the scalability uh, vision for Ethereum from Vitalik and others. How does Starkware see it? I know you've got um, StarkX that we were talking about, uh, and, and you also have um, StarkNet. I'm not sure really what that is. Maybe you could talk about that in the context sure. of your vision. Sure. So StarkX is our scalability app. And as I mentioned, it can support a, a, a certain set of, of, of functionality, you know, transfers, uh, trading of certain uh, types of assets, minting of NFTs. Uh, that's it right now. What we really want to have is something like StarkNet, which is our uh, a vision for a decentralized permissionless CK rollup. And there we're thinking of something which is really a very, very much an Ethereum-like experience. So anyone can, in a permissionless fashion, deploy whatever arbitrary a logic they want in the form of a, of a smart contract onto this layer two network. Uh, the the uh, users would be sending transactions into the network much like they do on Ethereum today. And the system would be properly decentralized at every single uh, layer. Now, uh, our intent is to take the StarkX installations deployments that we uh, will have uh, you know, deployed by then and offer them the ability to port in a very seamless fashion onto StarkNet if they so choose. 
uh, along with their user base and all that. So uh, that, that's the, the, the StarkNet vision. Of course, from our perspective, from a business perspective, this is a must because, uh, you know, as wonderful as the DYDX team is, uh, there was very close contact since, uh, when was it, Antonio? August or so of last year, uh, building the system together. Now, for us, it was hugely important to understand, you know, real customer needs, develop our software stack, help it, you know, sort of mature, uh, solidify, you know, this is sort of a, a real life testing of, of whether the toolbox that we're building is powerful enough. But to scale out the business, we need to get to the point where any, uh, uh, you know, any, any developer, any team of one or two or whatnot can deploy whatever idea they have onto the network without anyone's permission, without talking to us, regardless of whether Starkware exists or not. And they're off to the races. And that's what Starknet is, Starknet is all about. And this is sort of the vision that uh, we, we just raised Series B a couple of weeks ago. Uh, once again, led by Paradigm and with uh, three arrows and now Meta Research and a, a bunch of, uh, of our uh, early uh, backers like Sequoia and Founders Fund and Wing uh, and Pantera and DCBC. And, uh, and this is exactly the vision that, uh, that they're supporting, this permissionless decentralized ZK role. Yuri, I've got I've got a question for you because you seem to be a, a big thinker. So I want to see I want to see if you have any uh, it, how far your imagination goes. Uh, D, DYDX is a tried and true financial product that came before Ethereum, and it's just, and what DYDX is doing is taking this tried and true financial product and building it on this new financial platform. But that's doing an old thing in a new way, and that's really cool. But what about new things in new ways, specifically enabled by what you guys are building out at Starkware? How, what, what are the perhaps new financial products that could be built using this new platform? If you, could, if you let your imagination go, have you thought of any crazy ideas like this? Well, I, I think that there are a ton of very beautiful ideas. Um, thinking back, you know, a few years back, the first, the first time, this was like three years ago, and there was this, uh, I, I'm... I'm old and bald, but new to the blockchain space. <laughs> but uh, well, the first idea that sort of clicked in my mind where I heard it and I said, my God, this thing can open up new ideas. This was a company called Encent, which I think like Encent, incentivized, which I, I don't think uh, operates any longer. But their idea was to take NFTs as a means of tracking uh, all sorts of uh, uh, sort of uh, brokerage, uh, like uh, brokering uh, uh, dynamics. So, so if you help someone uh, fill a position, you know, like a uh, uh, staff staff a position in their company. If you help someone sell their house, so let's say you know I want to sell my house. I have an NFT that represents this sale. I give it to Ryan. He gives it to David because he knows David is interested in buying a house in my neighborhood. Now here, the the path of you know of attribution, who who was it who participated in, in introducing information into this market is tracked permissionlessly without any sort of ability to, to dispute this in a very immutable fashion by the NFT on the blockchain. So, and, and now let's say the brokerage, uh, the one and a half percent, whatever it is, is now split between David and Ryan. Okay, now Ryan, if he knows that David is interested in this, he wants to get this NFT to the buyer ASAP because if it, if it goes through Antonio, this reward needs to be split three ways, okay? Now think about this thing in the context of say real estate or something like that. Okay, so now you have this network no contracts need to be signed. Anyone can participate. Anyone can introduce information into the market and get compensated for it. You know, staffing, uh, you know, hiring, Silicon Valley hiring, or Israeli hiring for that matter is, is, is as vicious. Anyone can introduce information into the marketplace and be compensated for it. Now, this is a, this is a massively new idea. And if, 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 if the economics are, are uh, supportive of this and the, and the scaling is supportive of this, you can build some amazing stuff this way. Yuri, can we talk about some of the problems maybe that layer two faces or outstanding uh, issues, uh, I would say, or challenges maybe is another word for it. Um, one, one is this idea of kind of silos, right? The, the concept that we lose composability of all of the DeFi apps that are working together. So maybe sure. we have silos of liquidity. Maybe we, we also have silos of, of DeFi apps. Um, that that's the first problem. The second problem, which might be related in your mind, but it's how do we bridge all of these various layer twos together? Do you have any thoughts or answers on these? Sure. So, so first of all, we're of the camp that says that that the the sort of the idea I think that's been circulating 
systems and certain parts of the ecosystem that says, ah, you know, no, don't worry, everyone. Everyone's just going to migrate to the same layer two where you're just all going to meet there and it's all going to be dandy. That's sort of, you know, I think that's an absurd notion in a very tri trivial way, meaning if that environment can sustain all that activity automagically, why can't Ethereum do that? And, and of course, no single environment uh, uh, can do that. So, and, and as we see with DYDX and other teams, the design space is, is rather multidimensional and different teams will pick different uh, solutions. So from our perspective, it's gonna be a, a, a slew of different layer two solutions. And from our perspective, layer one is going to remain fundamentally central to all these things. And so for example, a design like DeFi pooling that we put out uh, is an example of, of how we believe that layer two will continue to interact very intimately with layer one, you know, years to come. Well, is layer one like the settlement layer for, for all of this? Well, no, so describe layer one? The, the concept of DeFi pooling, layer one is where DeFi is going to happen. Okay, and, and the pooling of, of demand for uh, uh, layer one uh, DeFi services is going to happen on layer two. So instead of, the, you know, David and Ryan and Ori, all of us, you know, each initiating a transaction going to Compound or Ave or whatever it is, we go to layer two, we create a pool. Think of this like, you know, pooling our uh, car pool. We pull our resources and only a single layer one transaction is initiated. But layer two here continues to interact in a very intelligent fashion, in a very cost-effective fashion with layer one. Now, the other thing I think which is very important, and, and this is sort of a responsibility of the different layer two solutions, is to ensure that those, the bridges between those are built in an efficient uh, manner. Meaning the worst thing that could happen to users is, is that if they want to go from one layer two to another layer two, they have to go out to layer one and cross over. And that would be very, very much sort of constraining uh, from their perspective. Uh, we uh, today, for example, for StarkX deployment system, going between DYDX and, and diversify soon immutable X, uh, other other uh, partnerships to be uh, uh, Badger and other announcements to be to follow in the coming weeks. Uh, you would be able to to move funds uh, using a, a crypto primitive we call uh, um, uh, I, I apologize. Uh, it, 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 the fast withdrawals is is powered. Uh, um, con uh, sorry, apologies. Conditional transfers is the uh, a blockchain crypt, uh, primitive. Uh, this allows for trustlessly moving funds across uh, StarkX deployments without going out to uh, layer one. So from one layer to, uh, from one StarkX to another, from one layer two to another. This can be done across ZK rollups. And fundamentally, there's no reason why this cannot be done between ZK rollups and other optimistic, and, and other layer two solutions like optimistic rollups. And I think you will see these things maturing and coming online uh, in the coming months and years. The other question that I have about the nature of L2s is, is the, the question of a, an on-ramp for, for fiat, right? Uh, and so right now, the, the, uh, the way that this works, if you want to get USDC into uh, DYDX, you got to go from, or you want, you want your money into DYDX, you go from bank account to centralized exchange to Ethereum L1, and now into DYDX on, the, on Ethereum L2. Uh, so my first question is, whose responsibility is it for making that system easier? Is it DYDX's responsibility for getting USDC onto the L2 to play with the DYDX? Or is it Starkware's responsibility to get USDC onto the L2? Who goes out and talks to Coinbase and Gemini and says, uh, come and deposit, is it come and deposit USD user funds into DYDX or is it come and deposit you or US, uh, the user funds onto Starkware? Who, who's who's, who's got to do this job? I think both of us. <laughs> yeah, I mean, obviously we both have a lot of incentives to be able to do this. Um, I think you're exactly right. I mean, I think the ideal system that we'd want to build here is just have centralized exchanges and more broadly, just like any crypto products that people support, even other layer twos, just have really seamless interoperability uh, with Starkware and kind of the system that we're building. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's definitely something that we're both working together uh, towards in terms of getting a lot of those integrations for the future. And, and, and I want to say that the fiat to, to crypto uh, on-ramp services, you know, like Wire and MoonPay and all those guys, they're not terribly happy with uh, layer one uh, transaction fees mm -hmm. because of their user experience, right? So if I, you know, charge a hundred bucks to my Visa and end up with 20 uh, bucks worth of ETH on layer one, uh, you know, I'm not terribly excited by, uh, by that user experience. So if right. I can move funds right. directly to layer two without going to layer one and uh, a tiny fraction of that cost, that's a big win for those services as well. You know, I've been kind of waiting for like um, 
the crypto bank's answer to something like Binance Chain. Um, and what I mean is like other crypto banks, like maybe Kraken or Gemini or, or, or a Coinbase, right? Because Binance approaches, we're going to create this whole sidechain thing uh, and we're going to push all of our liquidity into this sidechain that they, as we talked about earlier, uh, have, some, uh, <laughs> have some pretty strong control over. Um, I've been waiting for like a Coinbase or a Gemini to say, hey, we want to provide liquidity to this layer two Ethereum secured uh, chain and really kind of like push push that. I'm not sure if they're any closer to doing that. Do you think that's how um, this competition will, will shape up between the the Binances and the other crypto exchanges? I, I, I get that that gets into some speculation, but I'm curious about how you think this competitive industry shakes out. Uh, yeah, I can only speculate about that, but uh, having uh, sort of seen the, the uh, you know, uh, Coinbase S1 and, uh, and the material coming from, from uh, that direction, these are uh, operations that are profitable to a degree where it's difficult for them to sort of entertain things outside their sort of uh, main focus right now. And DeFi, as exciting as it is for us and has been for a good while, um, I think it's going to take time for the centralized exchanges to sort of you know step back and say this we need to seriously rethink our business in a fundamental way not you know not as sort of some uh, uh, side you know a small team you know over on the third floor that looks at this but you know this is going to affect the, the the whole business here and i think there's a reason you know why dydx is a, is a startup that that sort of started afresh and built this thing from the ground up. Uh, I think you need to have a, a, a fresh team and a fresh approach to, to do these things. And I think it's that's not easy for uh, established companies. So guys, as we come to a close here, and again, uh, thank you for coming on and, and sharing us uh, your, your time and answering some of our questions. Uh, Antonio, I know we asked uh, this when you came on to our AMA forever ago, but uh, the YouTube chat box will absolutely kill me if I don't ask this question. Uh, when DYDX token? Oh, oh man. Yeah, I knew it was coming. Um, <laughs> everybody asked me this. I mean, I'm just going to give you the same answer I've been saying for a while now. It's probably what I said before. Like, we believe that the best way to build DYDX and make DYDX huge in the future is, first of all, to build a great product. I mean, our goal at DYDX is to become one of the biggest crypto exchanges, period, like on a three to five year time horizon from now. Um, and we think the way to do, well, you know, I would argue the, the way we know that how to do that is first building a great product. And that's what we've been focused on for like three and a half years now. I mean, that's why I'm so excited about this newest product built on top of Starkware. Obviously, we've been talking about it, but think it's a huge leg up. And now we feel like we have that product, um, which can play like in the big leagues as everybody as good as like centralized exchanges. And of course, it's, you know, it's still something that's early we'll continue to improve it over time um so we're not done yet um but we think we're on much better footing now um so i think we're thinking about it uh, we're obviously paying a lot of attention to what's going on in the space really big champion still of kind of decentralized governance really excited about that community involvement um so no specifics but it's something we're definitely tracking um but we're still laser focused like we have been for the past three and a half years and we've gone through two cycles of this now, right? With the like 2017 ICOs, we were there for that. Um, and then this most recent kind of like liquidity mining craze, we're here for this as well. Um, but now I think the difference is we really feel like we do have a product that's just launched today, um, which can be successful. Um, and then kind of thinking about what comes next after that. Guys, uh, this has been a phenomenal conversation. I think we we married sort of the the DeFi app perspective and the scalability solution perspective really well. Um, I I, I want to end with with this question. I'll first direct this to Antonio, and then uh, Yuri can comment on it. But the question in my mind is: there are all these shortcuts you could take to scalability, and many chains have arguably taken these shortcuts. Many DeFi applications, scalability solutions have taken these shortcuts. Um, the, the path you guys have chosen uh, has been harder, it seems like, right? It's, it's, it's taken longer to get to, to this point. And I want to ask the question that we, we sort of ask many teams and many projects, which is this, why go to all this trouble? Is the decentralization that you're getting on the other side of this worth it? Maybe Antonio, you could comment first. 
Yeah, I mean, obviously, I think the answer is yes, and, and wholeheartedly. Um, I think just all, what I was alluding to before and kind of talking about with a lot of the limitations of centralized exchanges. And remember, when we talk about centralized exchanges, it's not just centralized cryptocurrency exchanges. It's literally the entire global financial system that we're talking about there, right? So it's like these things where there's no auditability in the systems, there's no transparency in the systems, they're very permissioned. Uh, you know, you have to trust your funds to various third parties when you're trading on them. That's the way all of finance works. And now we have a chance kind of for the first time, and I'm not the first to say this, right, but just like jumping on the bandwagon where we can reinvent that and, and rebuild that for things that are really core to the financial system. Obviously, the thing that we're focused on at DYDX uh, is specifically applying all of that to derivatives contracts. Um, but I think that's actually a really great and kind of prime use case for a lot of these advantages based on kind of what I was saying before. Currently very permission, they're currently very black box, they're very, very trusted, uh, not only with your funds, but with the execution of your contracts. And if you can take a lot of these advantages of decentralization and apply them to this, literally the biggest market in the world in derivative contracts, um, we think that that's just a complete game changer uh, for, for the whole global financial industry potentially, right? And, and that's the biggest market in the world and we're excited to tackle it. So I would say emphatically, yes. Yuri, same question to you. Why why go to all this trouble? So uh, the reason we we go out to this in, into all this trouble is because uh, we sort of try and think you know a few steps ahead, and the basic question is okay, what if everything we're doing succeeds you know in a phenomenal way, and this becomes a thousand or a million times bigger? Okay, so we're not dealing with uh, just let me pick on NFTs. We're not picking with NFT. You know, pick, you know, we're not looking at NFT cards that trade for uh, ten bucks. What about ten million bucks? or a hundred million bucks, okay? Now, if that asset is sitting on some side chain and suddenly this thing is worth a hundred million dollars, I wouldn't be sleeping well at night, okay? Um, if your application scales massively all of a sudden and, and you need to handle you know, many more transactions, et cetera, and certainly capital efficiency is just a, a huge factor, you know, how, how do you consider these things? And the way we see it, building layer two on top of, of Ethereum, building, uh, a validity proof system where the, the only thing that's allowed is a valid state transition in the system without any reliance on the integrity of the operators, et cetera. That is a path forward where we can say, we can see this thing massively growing and it doesn't fall apart. And that means there is a business to be built for us and for the likes of DYDX and any application developer out there. That's, that's, that's why we're doing it the way we're doing it. Well, very exciting, guys. Uh, we certainly appreciate your efforts, and it's been a pleasure to have you on Bankless. Thanks so much. Thank yeah, you. Thanks Jerry. so much for having us. Guys, action items. I think the best thing you can do with Layer 2 today and with DYDX uh, today is try it yourself. So you should go to the DYDX exchange. It's now deployed on Layer 2 and try it out. If you do so, we have a special code that we can share with you. Uh, it's in the show notes. It's trade.dydx.exchange slash r slash bankless. That will give you 10% off your trading fees. So get your MetaMask wallet connected and try out Layer 2. Try out DYDX. Of course, guys, we end every episode with this. Risks and disclaimers. ETH is risky, Bitcoin is risky, crypto is risky, so is DeFi. You could lose what you put in. Watch out for that margin, guys. But we are headed west. This is the frontier. It's not for everyone, but we're glad you're with us on the bankless journey. Thanks a lot.